Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. We're going to give yeah. one or two more minutes, and we will um, we'll get started here. Hi, Brittany. How are you? FYI, Javier, I think that um, all the broadcasters are able to hear you. Just wanted to give you a heads up. Oh, perfect. So it's live already or not? I just started the broadcast so we could get going here in the next minute or so. I think I think we can go ahead and get started. Let me shoot. Hey everybody, my name is Nick Barker and I organize our bite-sized lectures. Um, I'm excited today to talk about fluid stewardship. Uh, we have two great panelists that are gonna be discussing this with us. Uh, before we start that though, as always, I'd like to read our mission and vision. Um, our mission is to emulate SECM's mission, which is to secure the highest quality care for all critically ill and injured patients in the Southeast region by providing educational and research opportunities, as well as promoting multi-professional collaboration. The vision is that all critically ill and injured persons in the Southeast region will receive care from a present integrated team of dedicated trained intensivists and critical care specialists, as well as inspire new leaders and providers of critical care in the region. So today I'm honored to have um, Dr. Javier Neira and Dr. Brittany Bissell um, talk to us today about fluid stewardship. Dr. Neira is an associate professor of medicine, co-director of critical care nephrology, associate director of nephrology research and training center, and the clinical core director of the O'Brien Center for Acute Kidney Injury Research at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. His specific clinical and research interests are in the area of acute kidney disease and critical care nephrology. Dr. Brittany Bissell is a clinical pharmacist in the Pulmonary Medical Intensive Care Unit at the University of Kentucky. Her primary research interests include de-resuscitation and fluid stewardship, as well as immune, immunomodulation of sepsis. Her work in de-resuscitation within the critical ill has been awarded by the American Society of Health System Pharmacists and the American College of Clinical Pharmacology. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to our panelists and wish them the best. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Brittany, for joining as well. Um, so we're here to discuss fluids and um, we are going to have uh, where we decided to first um, discuss the role of uh, diuretics in de resuscitation. And I think we have an expert here that is uh, Dr. Brittany Bissell. Uh, actually, she has a lot of interest in how we can optimize and protocolize the use of diuretics in the ICU. And she had some interesting publications about it. And then I'm going to talk about the role of uh, extracorporeal removal of fluid with uh, kidney replacement therapies, in particular CRRT uh, in the fluid management, in this case specifically the resuscitation of patients that are critically ill. So I hope you enjoy. So we're going to do brief uh, discussions initially and then we will have um, the time uh, to address questions, comments from the audience. The idea is to make this as much interactive as possible. Thank you very much to all the organizers and we're ready to go. Brittany, please go ahead. You're... Dr. Bissell, I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Yes, Brittany, we cannot hear you. Uh, just be sure your mic is connected. 
you all hear me now? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not sure what happened. I just reconnected to the exact same thing. So anyway, here we go. So um, my name is Brittany, like uh, uh, Dr. Nera um, said, thank you so much everyone for joining. I want to focus specifically on diuretic de-resuscitation um, today, and then we can focus and, and chat about other specifics um, in, the, in the latter half of the talk. So kind of running through some of the introductions some of the basic points surrounding diuretic de-resuscitation from a fluid stewardship standpoint. Um, I will start off the conversation by saying, you know, as a pharmacist, there are a number of ways and potential venues for fluid stewardship. Obviously, um, this talk can be had in a numerous uh, and, and, and a lot of different fashions about a lot of specific um, modalities from just a pharmaceutical standpoint about how we can really decrease fluids or fluid exposure in the ICU. Um, just based on the topic today, I am going to kind of center the conversation from a pharmacist perspective on de-resuscitation. So, um, kind of broaching this, this topic or warming us up into the conversation surrounding de-resuscitation, it all comes back to like a very simple um, conversation that I think we're always, you know, encountering every day in the ICU, which is when it comes to fluids, you know, when do we strike the perfect balance between aggressive and excessive fluid um, administration, right? We know that um, in a certain amount of patients, particularly those presenting with sepsis, that Fluids help. Um, exposure to fluids has been shown to improve outcomes, particularly in those first six hours, a 24 hour period of, of ICU stay. Now, that's where things, I guess, after that point is where things become a lot less clear. Um, we're not really sure what patients respond best to fluids. We're not really sure exactly, you know, at what point cumulative vol uh, amount of volume becomes dangerous. Um, but we do know that too much fluid can be a bad thing. Um, and so it makes this conversation, in my opinion, a little bit difficult when talking about how we go about de-resuscitation and how we go about diuretic exposure, because there's so many unknowns. And so for me, the question always becomes assessing those knowns versus the unknowns and making the best recommendations we can for every patient population or every patient that we encounter. Um, other unknowns aside from specifically amount um, is again that inflection point from a time standpoint. So if we know that in the first 24 hours fluids are beneficial, we also know that there's data telling us that at around 72 hours fluid overload can be very harmful. So where in that time frame do we start seeking out um, de-resuscitation and, and de-resuscitative measures? And is that the same across every patient population? We also know that we don't really have a good um, standardized approach from a protocolized and a protocolized manner. Um, a lot of the studies that were done um, prior to 2020 centered around very niche patient populations. So maybe some heart failure data. Um, we do have some ARDS data, but we don't have really great data looking at broad ICU populations, um, specifically surrounding dosing of diuresis, administration of diuresis in the ICU setting. And we also still don't know definitively how to diurese. Um, I'm sure Dr. Nero may talk about this a little bit with his presentation as well, but you know, I think there's a lot of questions sometimes of how much is too much. And, and, and is there a way of, of assessing that in patients? Can we use our fluid responsiveness measures to kind of guide us for the de-resuscitation standpoint as well? So many questions left unknown, some things that we do know. So I wanna talk about kind of focusing on those unknowns and making it a little bit more clear. So uh, prior to um, 2020, there had only been one study that really sought to evaluate factors or risk factors for fluid overload, right? So if we, in the most simplistic fashion say, okay, we know fluid overload is harmful. So how do we mitigate that? Or how do we prevent that? Or who is at risk of that? Um, there's really only one study that had sought to evaluate those risk factors. Um, and so this study of 400 patients receiving mechanical ventilation in the ICU for at least a day, they showed similar outcomes that we've all come to know, right? So day three fluid balance is associated with poor outcomes, particularly mortality in this study. Day one and two fluid balance um, were predictors of that day three fluid balance, as probably most of us would imagine, as well as your diuretic dose was an influencer of that fluid balance. But unfortunately, when looking at risk factors, they weren't able to find 
a lot of risk factors specifically surrounding who is at risk for overload. But a lot of the patients did experience volume overload. So the vast majority of patients in this study had a positive volume status with only a quarter of the patient, patient population receiving diuresis. In this study, like a lot of the studies that had been published um, prior to the past couple of years, showed a similar kind of diuretic exposure that we're, we tend to see um, outside of a protocolized fashion, which is the median furosemide dose in this study specifically was zero milligrams. And surveys have been performed to try to assess perspectives around diuresis and deresuscitation. When do physicians or pharmacists provide um, a, a diuretic? When are they choosing to evaluate for need for diuresis? And so the data here on this study are from two different um, cohorts. To the left, you'll see a study that we performed um, a pharmacist looking at how frequently they are involved, how protocolized diuresis is. And you'll see here, Pharmacist involvement was not uh, typical in the majority of patients. So really it was the minority of pharmacists that were actually actively involved um, in diuresis or administration of diuresis. So dose selection, choosing to diuresis, starting diuresis, stopping diuresis and so forth. Um, we also saw that unsurprisingly, the vast majority of institutions do not have current standardized approaches. So no protocols, not a lot of you know, guidelines in place. Um, some pharmacists did cite education measures that they were doing, but nonetheless, for the most part, no real standardized approach. Um, to the right, this figure um, was from a physician survey specifically evaluating how they went about diuresis. And I, this uh, diagram breaks down the type of diuretic. And I, pointed, I point this diagram out specifically because you'll see here again, the majority of the time they're not citing diuretic use. They're not giving diuresis to the most of their patients as shown by the dark um, navy blue line. And when they are, they are giving some um, loops. Now our post-cardiac surgical units tend to be a little bit better about this than probably some of our other areas. But nonetheless, we see a, a, a really a, a minority of patient populations really receiving diuresis within the ICU, despite the benefits for deresuscitation or mitigation of, of volume overload as seen in previous studies. Um, again, kind of focusing back on the surveys, so specifically pharmacists responded that they weren't really typically diuresing patients until they were really having signs of volume overload. So edema, ventilator mean difficulty. Um, they saw a net positive fluid balance. Um, I know at our institution, we've had patients that were like, oh my goodness, they're 20, 30 liters positive uh, today. And so unsurprisingly, these were number one indications for diuresis because what this is really pointing at is probably a lack of foresight in a lot of our minds um, especially prior to five years ago, about actively thinking about deep resuscitation daily. And then dosing frequency was a little bit um, diverse, kind of all over the place with predominantly us just dosing one time, um, us being us as an all pharmacists kind of citing this. Um, notable responses are, other, um, are also listed here. These are just specific stats that were um, called out in this survey of pharmacists that I thought were interesting. Again, majority of the time, we weren't meeting our end goal. Um, majority of the time, we're underdosing diuresis. Um, and almost half of the time, we're able to achieve a net negative fluid balance after 72 hours after shock resolution. And I call that out because it's probably one of the clearest patient populations where you should be achieving a net negative fluid balance, all other things considered equal. And so, again, all of this really to say, we tend to underdo it, or we're not really doing it to the best of our abilities. Um, and it's not too surprising. If we look at how we dose diuretics and really extrapolating this data into the ICU population, we really don't have a lot of great data from a PKPD standpoint of how diuretics are most effective within the ICU setting. Um, we know that we know that um, with a um, decrease in creatinine clearance, um, you will have decreased responsiveness to our most common loop diuretics. But if we look at doses that have been reported in the literature within this population, they're really wide ranging. And so just trying to pull in our basics of PKPD and exposure data, we don't have a lot of information in the ICU to really tell us how to go about um, dosing diuretics. If we think through the types of diuretics, um, I will focus specifically on loops just because they are our strongest diuretics within the intensive care unit. We run into the least amount of issues with other um, PK, um, PD, or organ dysfunction considerations. When deciding between the three diuretics, um, most of the data tells us there's not a lot of reason to choose one versus the other. Um, 
You know, I know shortages is always something on, on the front forefront of our minds. Um, and so furosemide, knock on wood, has been probably the most stable um, as far as availability standpoint over the last 10 years um, and the one with IV access as well. So kind of focusing and narrowing in on how we choose diuresis. I say this point is not necessarily as clear. You, it's not as definitive as far as what loop diuretic, um, but definitely starting with a loop diuretic and really your institutional uh, diuretic of choice um, as far as loops. And so this is what we utilize at our institution. This is our um, protocol. Uh, this is the first protocol um, that we have implemented within our intensive care unit. We're constantly trying to work to evolve um, and improve uh, our diuretic approaches. Um, and this is um, ultimately what we studied with the data that I'll, I'll show you here in a moment. And so how we go about choosing furosemide is really kind of focusing on the fact that we don't have a lot of strong predictors of furosemide response within the intensive care unit aside from underlying renal function. Um, and again, because we don't have a lot of data, we have a lot of flexibility in my opinion, as far as how we start those initial doses. But for us, we tend to go between 40 to 80 milligrams of IV furosemide, all other things considered equal. Um, and that is specifically in patients without AKI, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Um, and then we schedule this typically every eight hours. At our institution, our protocol allows for automatic dose increases if patients aren't meeting goals. Um, but this is what you'll see at our institution. So starting with that initial dose, um, if the patient has known uh, furosemide exposure, we choose our first dose on the basis of that um, and the responsiveness to that initial dose. Um, we start with a two-hour assessment to make sure their urine output, they've responded, which we'll talk about here in a second of what that means. Um, and then we're constantly assessing that goal every eight hours and then choosing to increase or decrease the dose based on what our goal is um, for that given time period. Our specific hold parameters um, for our institution are here. Um, I will say that for the most part, um, these are relatively arbitrary, um, especially the serum creatinine rise. Uh, we tend to see serum creatinine rises just based on the nature of de-resuscitation, particularly in, in patients that are fluid overloaded. And I think most of us know that um, you, you almost expect a serum creatinine rise with the, the exposure of loop diuretics. And sometimes that's actually a good thing and not necessarily harmful. So these hold parameters, as mentioned on the previous slide, those are hold parameters for our nursing staff to then prompt to talk to the physician or pharmacist in order to continue the dose. So not necessarily we stop diuresin at that point, um, but those are hold parameters to just ensure safety of continued administration. So we did study this protocol um, here at our institution, and we found that compared to standard of care, um, we significantly improved fluid balance. We didn't see any change in ventilator days as one may have expected, um, particularly with the data surrounding fluid overload and mechanical ventilation. Um, but we did see uh, a significant difference in hospital mortality. This was a secondary outcome, so I, I don't want to draw any definitive conclusions from that. But I think, and again, as, as Dr. Nero probably will talk about uh, here shortly, um, you know, being able to keep patients in a net negative or net even fluid balance has the potential impact to affect a number of different organ systems, organ systems besides just um, the respiratory inability to wean off of the bed. Um, we also saw that patients that received more aggressive diuresis early on, um, were less likely to need renal replacement therapy at one point in their ICU stay or at discharge. Um, specific considerations about our study, and I, I like calling these out because I think these um, specifically talk to what, what other patients we should be including. So when we evaluated our, um, our protocol here, we excluded patients with AKI and those on vasopressors. Um, and I think there's an argument to include patients in both populations or both cohorts. So what we know now um, about the furosemide stress test data, which has shown us you know, on the left here, that exposure of, of high um, dose furosemide um, can be very predictive um, with a, an area under the curve of 0.87, which is pretty impressive for the ICU. Um, of that stage three or later, uh, later on stages of acute kidney, kidney injury. When it comes to vasoactives, um, there's also been a few different studies now, albeit all retrospective, that have actually demonstrated safety and potential beneficial incomes or outcomes um, in exposing patients, the right patients um, on vasoactive therapy to diuresis. So in my opinion, ultimately, diuresis more optimally looks like what you see here on this slide. Um, and it can be a little bit of a lot, but it's really, I think it, um, it's pretty um, intuitive 
and kind of thinking through. So in those patients that are past that 24 hour mark, um, requiring stably, uh, stable doses of, of norepinephrine um, for at least six hours, I think you can really start assessing patients for diuresis at that point, um, if not sooner in the right patient population. So this is not considering those with coming in with acute decompensated heart failure or other signs of volume overload. And then it's all on the basis of underlying renal function. So whether they have AKI and if so, kind of shooting them down that route for furosemide stress test. And then if they don't have AKI, kind of following what we follow a little bit more specifically here at our institution, which is have they exposed, uh, had exposure to furosemide and dosing based on that with, with quick follow-up um, and assessment. And so Talking about who and when um, specifically for diuresis, these are the patient populations kind of in specific categories and breakdowns of who likely needs diuresis. So the patients that definitely need diuresis, uh, I think are the most clear patient populations of anyone with signs of volume overload, particularly pulmonary edema, um, edema or intra-abdominal hypertension, um, poor signs of volume overload on the echo. Probable diuresis, so these patients most likely will benefit um, those patients that you're looking to extubate, those patients with that stage one to two AKI that are furosemite responsive, um, stable or decreasing vasoactives. And then again, after the 24 hour period, um, patients with a positive fluid balance to make sure we're mitigating um, a potential for worse outcomes at that 48 and 72 hour mark. Other areas that are a little less defined or maybe a little bit more arguable um, for some specific reasons, acute lung injury. We do have some data with ARDS about the benefit of conservative fluid volumes. Um, there's more and more data coming out now um, expressing differences in phenotypes. So I hate to make general recommendations just on the basis of that. Um, there are, but for the majority of the patients, they likely will benefit from some diuresis. Stage three AKI, again, this becomes a conversation of are they furosemide responsive or not at the point at that time? And are we doing really any benefit with continuing diuresis? Should we be calling nephrology colleagues um, for renal replacement modalities? Fluid responsive, fluid unresponsiveness and stable vasoactives. Um, again, I could make a whole lecture on fluid responsiveness. So I think this just makes it a little bit more murky by kind of adding in that fluid unresponsiveness. But I think Again, once you have a patient who's stabilized from a hemodynamic standpoint, there is the potential for um, appropriate de-resuscitation in that patient population. And then fluid balance, specifically at that 24-hour mark. Um, again, we break it down into the weeds of, of very specific numbers. 24-hour um, fluid balance is shown to be beneficial, but it's really kind of once you hit that time frame, you could consider diuresis, um, and, and then likely most patients at that point. So. I did not mean, I don't want to take up a ton of time, so that's kind of just my brief introduction um, to diuresis, and I'm happy to kind of chat through um, the rest of our time today after Dr. Nero's conversation um, about specifics and logistics and things of that manner. So thanks everyone for listening in. Thank you, uh, Brittany. That was a very nice um, introduction to this uh, complex topic and uh, I'm gonna continue our, our session uh, with a brief presentation about the role of uh, kidney replacement therapies in this context. So I'm gonna try to share my screen and then uh, PowerPoint. And uh, you guys tell me, are you able to see the slides? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to uh, let me just minimize this. Excellent. Okay. So let's, uh, these are my disclosures. And um, uh, I'm just going to emphasize the point, can we use kidney replacement therapy to optimize fluid management and can we do it better? So that's the, the whole point of my presentation. I'm trying to remove, okay, I was able to remove that panel. So if you remember this gentleman, uh, Winston Churchill, right? If you recognize him, um, he has this uh, quote that I always remember, those who never change their minds, never change anything. So, and I think fluid management in the ICU is one of those things that uh, we continuously learn according to what the patient is telling us. And uh, certainly we adjust our prescriptions based on that. That happened for diuretic management, 
and that certainly happens when we are removing fluids with kidney replacement therapies. So the idea, of course, is to prevent organ ischemia and also prevent organ edema. So how to find this optimal fluid uh, status for the patient uh, after we have been evaluating the trajectory of the critical illness and the patient. Of course, early on in the trajectory, a lot of the time the goal is to mitigate the ischemia part and we give the patient fluids. But at certain point, we need to stop giving the patient fluids and also mitigate the organ edema that can evolve. This gets complicated, of course, in patients that uh, have low effective circulating volume. But how we mitigate this organ edema, as it was mentioned, uh, restricting the intake, diuretics, and we can do also renal replacement therapy. We recognize the phases of resuscitation, uh, but I just wanna always emphasize that after the stabilization phase, um, the de-escalation starts. And here, a lot of the times nephrologists are called to the ICU uh, to evaluate if the patient is a good candidate for renal replacement therapy. Markers that we use routinely are fluid overload. We use it as a percentage, uh, sometimes uh, of the comparing the current weight versus the admission weight of the patient. And if you don't have a good uh, protocol to uh, collect uh, trends of weights in your ICU, you can uh, use the fluid balance, the cumulative fluid balance of the patient in relation to the admission weight to determine what's the level of fluid overload percentage in that patient. When it is more than 10, 20%, certainly we need to mitigate the further accumulation of fluids and there is a role for kidney replacement therapies in that context. Now this observation has been also done at the time of RRT initiation. So this was a, this is a table describing pediatric studies. As you know, uh, this observation of fluid overload was initially detected uh, more consistently in the pediatric critically ill population. So when they evaluated the fluid overload percentage with these strategies I mentioned, at the time of CRRT initiation in different studies, it was clear that the patients that died had higher, sometimes more than double, fluid overload at the time of CRRT initiation. And when you put this fluid overload in different models to see the relationship with mortality, it always came as an independent factor associated with mortality. How about in adults? In adults, this association has also been very obvious. This is a, a classic study many years ago, the Picard study, uh, evaluating a prospective cohort of 600 patients in the ICU, all of these patients with acute kidney injury. So they evaluated fluid overload uh, using a window of three days before the kidney, con the nephrology consultation in the ICU. And, uh, and the time uh, to the time of CRRT initiation or RRT initiation. So RRT initiation minus three, they determine the fluid overload of the patient. And as you can see, when they classify this according to the cutoff of 10%, you see the differentiation in the Kaplan-Meier corpse where fluid overload patients have lower chances of survival uh, during the observation period of this study. Now, what was the impact of fluid overload for mortality? The adjusted odds were at least two, a double, so 2.07, twice the risk of dying if the patient had fluid overload more than 10% during that window. Many, many studies that we cannot review, but this is a study on, uh, from our group uh, where we evaluated specifically uh, patients with septic shock that uh, have different degrees of AKI and chronic kidney disease at baseline. And if you see in the right side of the slide, the, in the x-axis is the cumulative fluid balance in quintiles, and in the y-axis is the standardized mortality ratio. So this, this figure is representing that there is a dose-response relationship between cumulative fluid balance and death, independently if the patients had AKI and or prevalent CKD. And when we look into cutoffs that could be associated with this increased risk of mortality, all the cutoffs were around between five and 
Importantly as well, fluid overload at the time of RRT initiation has been associated with organ recovery. In this particular study, kidney recovery was evaluated in a cohort of uh, close to 200 patients. Here, uh, there was one third of the patients recovered one year after discharge to the point that were, they were liberated from dialysis. Uh, they were no longer on dialysis. And when they review what are those parameters that associated with this kidney recovery, fluid overload was one of the ones in the multivariable models that came independent as a predictor of kidney recovery up to one year after discharge. This is a different study from our group. We evaluated at the time of CRRT initiation fluid overload percentage uh, and evaluated the outcome of major adverse kidney events. What is this outcome? This outcome is a combination of mortality, kidney recovery, meaning independence of, of any type of dialysis. And also if your GFR is not below 50% from baseline. So when we look at this, we found that fluid overload more than 10% was independently associated with a higher risk of make at 90 days. And as you can see in the figure, there is again a dose response relationship, higher fluid overload, higher risk of make in the Y axis. So fluid overload represent a potentially modifiable risk factor that should be further examined in interventional studies, right? Now we talk about fluid overload mortality and organ recovery. Now, how about fluid removal? So in the last few years, uh, studies by Raghi Murugan and colleagues and a lot of uh, sub-analysis of the renal trial were done. Uh, this is a study, one of the first ones, in which they look at a cohort of about a thousand patients with fluid overload more equal 5% prior to RRT initiation they evaluated fluid removal that in technical terms is net ultrafiltration. And this was calculated as the net volume of fluid ultrafilter per day from the initiation of RRT until the end of ICU stay and was adjusted by the body weight of the patient. The outcome here was one year mortality. They found that the net ultrafiltration intensity more than 25 ml kJ per day versus less equal 20 ml kJ per day was associated with lower one year risk of mortality. As you, and you can see the separation there in the Kaplan-Meier figure. Now, remember, these patients were all having at least a mild to moderate degree of fluid overload, 5% prior to RRT initiation. So this showed that patients that tolerated or in which we were able to remove fluids more than 25 ml kJ per day, they did better in terms of mortality. In a different study, this was a post hoc analysis of the renal trial, um, about uh, close to 500 patients, uh, 1,500 patients. The evaluation was the same, net ultrafiltration, but here was defined in different units, ml kJ per hour, was defined as the volume of fluid removed per hour adjusted for patient body weight different to the prior study that evaluated this parameter per day. This was evaluating this, uh, this metric per hour. They look into 90-day mortality, and they found that when the net ultrafiltration was greater than 1.75 ml kJ hour, the highest tertile in the cohort, versus less than 1.01, the lowest tertile, this uh, was associated with lower survival. So higher net UF was not good for the patient. Different to the prior study where we saw higher net UF was beneficial in terms of survival. Here, there were all comers that were enrolled in the renal trial, was not restricted to a subset of patients that had mild to moderate fluid overload before RRT initiation. So a big difference to know there. The group, uh, the, this group continued to examine these patterns, and this was a survey study was published in, in CCMED about uh, what were the common prescription patterns and, and hindrances to execute the prescription in a multinational survey study of uh, 1,500 participants. As you can see, uh, the figure, 
uh, in terms of uh, what net ultrafiltration rates you prescribe according to countries, there is a lot of variability, right? So the study identifies significant international practice variation in net ultrafiltration, barriers and specific targets for quality improvement initiatives, right? So when the, this heterogeneity in practice was in part explained by these factors, when the uh, surveys were like uh, uh, ask what is the what are these barriers to effective net ultrafiltration a lot of the time the answer was patient intolerance also sometimes frequent interruptions with the treatment and many other factors there that you can uh, imagine based on your own practice right now the problem when you analyze retrospective data in terms of fluid removal is of course indication bias right so this, this, this group continued to assess different cohorts and they evaluated this small cohort of 400 patients to determine if the time of the net ultrafiltration play a role. So they define early net ultrafiltration, early fluid removal in the first 48 hours with the same cutoffs that they determined from the renal post hoc analysis looking into 28 day mortality they found the same uh, observation, the net ultrafiltration rate more than 175 versus less than 1.01 were associated with increased mortality. And of course, this is the breakdown according to the hazard ratio in the intervals they evaluated the first week, second week, third week, and subsequently through the first 28 days, the observation was consistent that higher net ultrafiltration associated with worse outcome, in this case, mortality. Now, they tried to do uh, a study addressing the indication bias. So in this same cohort of four, uh, close to 400 patients, they assessed the association of fluid removal, net ultrafiltration rate with mortality and its interaction with possible mediators. In this case, an important mediator will be fluid balance of the patient, right? hemodynamic status, some electrolyte abnormalities. So they did some mediation analysis, but again, this was a limited being the sample size of the cohort and a single center study. Uh, nonetheless, they found that adjusting in, by these uh, possible uh, mediators in this analysis, net ultrafiltration more than 1.75 ml kJ per hour was independently associated with increased hospital mortality and this effect was not mediated by the fluid balance of the patient, hypotension, vasopressor use, and some electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia. Now, here you can see that uh, a point that is very important when you talk about fluid removal. So this is the same patient, right? This is just one example, but with the same net ultrafiltration prescription, let's imagine is 1.2, uh, mLs kJ per hour, uh, you can achieve different fluid balance on the patient in different days. In the first day, the patient is in positive fluid balance. You are below target if you want to be negative. Imagine this patient is already fluid overloaded. On the second day, the patient is in negative fluid balance, which is possible the target that we want in a patient that is fluid overloaded. But the net ultrafiltration has not changed in these two days. So that's why it's an, um, not, uh, while informative, is not the only marker we should follow when you are assessing fluid management in a patient on kidney replacement therapy. So another important aspect is the gap between what we prescribe and what we achieve. This is, was a study we did at the University of Kentucky and Dr. Bissell was involved in this study. Uh, when we uh, evaluated a cohort of close to 800 patients, but to address the issue of indication bias, here we restricted this cohort to patients that in, we, in which the average goal fluid balance was at least net negative half a liter per day on average. So this means that these were patients that during the time of CRRT, the clinicians were prescribing on average a net negative half a liter fluid balance per day in these patients. So as you can see, the, when you see in the x-axis the mLKJ hour of the fluid balance, 
the patients, we want it to be negative, right? So to the left side, what we prescribe is to be negative in red, but we were not achieving that. A lot of these patients were not that negative as we were prescribing, or worse than that, they were positive in terms of fluid balance comparing to what the goal was of treatment. So this is a gap that is important, right? And I encourage all of you to pay attention to this parameter when you are having a patient on CRRT in, we, in which you want to remove fluid. What are we prescribing and what are we achieving? That gap, why it's important? Because that gap, similar to being in positive fluid balance, it's associated with increased risk of mortality. So this diagram represents the positive fluid balance during RRT, different to the prior studies that we were evaluating fluid overload, cumulative fluid balance before RRT was initiated. This study evaluated positive fluid balance during CRRT. And you can see that there is a dose response relationship, more positive fluid balance in patients that you want to remove fluid associated with increased risk of mortality. Now, importantly, if we classify the patients according to the gap between what we prescribe and what we achieve, you will, rec you will recognize here different phenotypes of patients. Achiever patients with negative fluid balance, the dots are green, very few of course, but the, the risk of mortality is very low because we wanted to remove fluid and we know fluid overload is not good for the patient. In the underachievers, we have two groups. The ones that despite they underachieved, they were still in negative fluid balance in orange. There is, they have an increased risk of mortality comparing to the ones that were at goal, but not as bad as the patients that did not achieve the goal and were on positive fluid balance. Very important to recognize this. So this percentage gap of the, what we prescribe and what we deliver is an important indicator of risk of mortality in patients on CRRT in which we want to remove fluids, right? And you can see this relationship with mortality in this diagram. So what happened with the parameter I was referring before, the net ultrafiltration, we also checked that. And as you can see, similar to the first study I presented, higher net ultrafiltration associated with lower risk of mortality, again, because this cohort is restricted to patients that clinicians wanted to remove fluids. So we can assume they had already some degree of fluid overload that was important for clinicians to determine, I want to remove on average net negative to achieve half a liter of fluid balance per day, negative. So that's important. So not if we take the net UF based on the prior literature as an absolute number without the context of the patient, we can be misled in what we should do. That being said, extremes are never good. So definitely there is a signal of harm if you are too aggressive removing fluids that we learn from those studies. And if you see this percentage gap between what you prescribe and you deliver, similar relationship as the positive fluid balance I showed you earlier, with the same phenotypes of patients according to the gap between what you prescribe and what you achieve, right? So this percentage gap replicates very similarly the positive fluid balance curve. Now, of course, the question is, if I have a gap, what caused the gap and how we can close the gap, right? Certainly, there are many factors, but just to summarize here, you can have an inadequate prescription. This means that the patient is not really requiring fluid removal and you need to reassess the goals of treatment. You may have a good prescription, but it is not being delivered effectively due to treatment interruptions, problems with the catheter, the nurse not understanding the prescription, many factors, but it's ineffective. Patient intolerance, maybe the patient needs fluid removal, but you need to adjust the rate of fluid removal, is not able to tolerate the prescription. And you may need sometimes a little bit of vasopressor support to help with refilling, and many, many other factors why a patient cannot tolerate fluid removal. 
Now, what we can do, of course, is assess, and this was a recent review article very elegantly done by William Belbing, uh, to how to balance the risk of intolerance to fluid removal versus the risk of congestive organ injury. And on top of our clinical evaluation, now we can have supporting information, perhaps with uh, ultrasonographic features of the vexus, of the IVC, or the heart dynamics, right? So definitely we have better tools now to assess a patient in which we have a big gap with, between what we are prescribing and what we are achieving. So to summarize, we need to recognize that patients have different fluid balance status and fluid balance goals, and this can change during the trajectory of critical illness, that the impact of fluid derangements vary between patients. And if we assess this net UF in a curve between harm benefit, we need to recognize that high net UF for one patient may be low for a different patient. And right now we need to personalize our fluid management with CRRT without a specific parameters. However, recognize too fast may not be too may not may not be good for the patient. And also, if you are not achieving the goal that you are prescribing, may not be good for the patient. Now, take-home points: fluid removal during CRRT is a potentially modifiable risk factor that needs to be tested in interventional studies, right? So now we need to do interventional studies with extracorporeal de-resuscitation of patients, target, targeting different strategies and dynamic adjustment of these strategies to hopefully achieve the goal of the prescription and then guide a little bit better our practice. Observational studies, all of the studies I presented today are observational, uh, examining the role of net ultrafiltration and outcomes may be confounded by indication the goal of fluid removal may be affected by many factors, inadequate prescription, the clinician, right? The deliverable, the machine or the nurse or tolerance of the patient. And the percentage gap from prescribed fluid balance goal should be continuously monitored as a new quality indicator of CRRT delivery. So next time you're around, maybe later today or in the subsequent days in the ICU when you have a patient on CRRT, just ask yourself that question. What are we prescribing and what are we achieving? And if you find a big gap there, reassess. There is something not good that is going on that you can attack and hopefully impact the patient. So with that, I'm gonna finish opening this discussion. This is my email. So I'm always happy to get in touch with you. If you have questions or concerns or comments to improve fluid management in the ICU. Thank you very much. And with Thank that, you. sorry, go ahead. Thank you. No, I was just asking, is, is a Brittany back on the, I just want to try. Yes, she's back there. Excellent. Okay. So um, I don't know, uh, at this stage, uh, we would like to address questions uh, from the moderator or from the audience. Uh, if you want to put them on the chat, uh, we're happy to entertain some of those questions, or we can have just a discussion between the three of us about how we can do this better in our ICUs. I'm not sure if you can see the first question in there, but I'm going to read it out loud for everybody. What are your thoughts on using diarrheal for furosemide potentiation, and when should it be considered after what Lasix dose challenge is essentially what they're getting? Sure, so um, I will openly say I'm a little bit biased in my response here, um, just because, and I'll kind of explain a little bit of why, um, I feel like we start to get really concerned about hypernatremia when we start diuresing patients, sometimes a little bit more quickly than probably necessary. Um, and so I see quite a bit of hypernatremia not um, over hypernatremia, not severe hypernatremia, but I start to see trending um, of sodium levels that start to rise when we start diuresing these patients, not surprisingly. Um, and what I ultimately see, so my bias towards early use of adjuncts, is we start trying to mitigate this with things such as free water. And I notice a lot of the times, at least at my institution, we, we find ourselves in a catch-22 
where we start giving more volume for hypernatremia. And then we're looking at our daily eyes and nose and trying to become more net negative. Um, we really just have this very secular response uh, of really treating ourselves, I think, a lot of the time. Um, and so because and for that reason, I actually tend to use, I myself use metolazone um, much earlier on um, than probably most folks, I would say. Um, as far as diarrheal versus metolazone, um, it, probably any of the pharmacists on the call um, know that there's been a couple of studies that have been done, showed no real benefit in using diarrheal over metolazone. Um, and you get a lot, uh, you save a lot of money, which administration will appreciate um, when opting for that metolazone alternative. Um, and so we tend to use metolazone um, in patients that are starting to have creeping sodium levels. I think it's also great as an adjunct, um, but I think particularly it's a safe drug. You don't run into a lot of issues with it in the intensive care unit population. Um, so I actually, I pull for, it's in our order set for our diuresis protocol is like one of our first other options. Um, again, because it, it tends to work well in combination, um, kind of mitigate some of that risk of hypernatremia um, and kind of prevent some of those additional issues down the line. Yeah. So, uh, Brittany, I have a question for you um, that, um, so when we are called, of course, uh, in the nephrology side, a lot of the times the intensivists have tried many things. Among those things with uh, some uh, evolving evidence, we have the use of hypertonic saline uh, for diuresing patients and also the use of albumin. Right. So what are your takes on that? So you as an expert pharmacist in the ICU, what's, what are the scenarios you really consider these adjuvant uh, therapies for diuresing a patient and uh, how you can uh, guide the audience into the most evidence based use of them? Yeah, so I find um, so. I'll, I'll kind of tackle both parts of the question, albumin versus hypertonic. I find the hypertonic data very interesting. Um, I will say we haven't pulled, at least in the general ICU population, that hasn't really been a conversation for us yet. Um, I know especially like um, at some of the larger um, kidney meetings and I'll, you know, I think our nephrologists are probably more keen on the data, especially yourself surrounding hypertonic. I don't think um, in the ICU setting, everyone has started to fear sodium chloride at this point. And so I think the concept of, of hypertonic and adding hypertonic is not one that's probably been quickly adopted. Um, but I do find that data to be very interesting. Um, I'm not pulling for it just based on the data that are available or, or aren't available at this point. But I do think it's a novel area that needs additional study for sure. As far mm -hmm. as albumin, I almost feel that um, feel like opposite, I guess I would say, with albumin. Not that albumin has been, you know, studied well in a large randomized control trial by any means, um, but in the studies that have been performed with the use of albumin, the only populations that really saw benefit, now I'm talking general ICU patient population, um, but the only time that's really shown to benefit is when we really weren't diuresing patients significantly, so we weren't giving them very high doses of furosemide. And for me, you run into a lot of issues with albumin. So the thought is, you know, protein binding potentially of the drug, um, but you also have to run into other, you have to think about other considerations. Does the patient have any proteinuria? Are you potentially worsening things on that end? What is going to be the free drug ultimately the side of action and does albumin affect that or not? And so I think albumin got some attention um, as an adjunct kind of initially, at least in my opinion, on the PKPD. So we know the properties of, of loops that may or may not coincide well with albumin. But in the studies that have been done, it's really fallen short unless you aren't diuresing appropriately. So my my thing is, instead of giving albumin, just give more furosemide. You know, if you have someone that's especially responsive um, or you haven't even tried to, you know, give them a, a big enough dose to really truly assess responsiveness, I'm, I'm still pulling out for more loops um, and, and just based on the data that's available. I'm not sure what your thoughts are. You may have a little no, bit of no, practice. Th thank you for that answer. So, uh, for example, right now, the um, the, SNR, the clinical scenario, I feel fairly comfortable using albumin to diarrhea patient is nephrotic syndrome, as you as you refer to a uh, patient with uh, very severe nephrotic syndrome, confirmation of a significant degree of proteinuria. Uh, sometimes uh, these patients uh, already have had uh, 
some type of glomerular disease for a while, exposed to many diuretics. They have hypertrophic nephrons. And uh, I have seen uh, some um, uh, help in some scenarios with the use of uh, colloids, like in this case, albumin to diurese them. Um, I typically like, uh, because of the short life, try to use the diuretics uh, very close after the infusion of the albumin, so to potentiate the effect. But that will be one scenario. Uh, and then I agree with you. I think the evidence uh, it's very, is not very robust because it has not been studied really um, specifically as uh, albumin as an adjuvant for diuretic. It just has been small observations and uh, some extrapolation of other data we made. Um, and then I agree uh, with you, the use of hypertonic saline it's captured some attention, particularly because it's been used a lot in the heart failure space. And in the, as you know, the cardiologists always like to do quick trials and uh, see how effective this could be. Uh, and of course, I mean, if you um, remember the components of why a patient or any individual make urine, and you have, of course, the osmotic load that that kidney receives and the ability of the kidney to concentrate of dilute the urine, right? So assuming um, a patient with heart failure will always have um, elevated ADH. So uh, try to overcome that by the fact of loading the kidney with uh, a hypertonic solution uh, makes some sense as an adjuvant in addition to the effect of the diuretics, right? Um, so it's, it's a little bit those scenarios like uh, you have patients that uh, are very difficult to diarrhea. Uh, don't respond to standard uh, use of diuretics, even when sequential nephron block, different uh, diuretics being used. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a consideration, and I think the data is evolving. And uh, yeah, so we, as long as you monitor and the patient uh, is able to uh, urinate all the salt load, uh, should not create too much trouble, but uh, the problems typically will start if the patient start developing also some degree of kidney injury, kidney dysfunction, uh, then that become very ineffective. That's when uh, everything I mentioned about extracorporeal removal of fluids play a, play a role. But yeah, so I think uh, there is definitely more tools now uh, for us to properly de-resuscitate a patient uh, with medical management first, and uh, if that doesn't work, uh, certainly RRT it's available uh, in many hospitals now. I think do we have another question there? I think. Yep, I think um, we have two more questions here. One was saying um, you guys discuss a lot regarding post resuscitation care with renal replacement therapy in diuresis. What are your thoughts on more judicious use of fluids during the resuscitation phase of care? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. So the I, I think uh, there is better evidence now that uh, we need to quickly identify a patient that is not responsive to fluids. And uh, the, especially when we are resuscitating a patient uh, with sepsis. Um, now, uh, there are scenarios, of course, that the resuscitation phase can be a little bit more liberal in terms of fluids, uh, like patients, particularly after abdominal surgeries. Uh, so one size does not fit all, but uh, the, what has changed is that we recognize two things, right? One is that it's not only to give fluids to a patient, but also to assess fluid responsiveness. If the patient really eats, uh, the, the fluids are helping them. Number one. And number two is like not every time a patient is hypotensive is related because patient is intravascularly volume depleted so that we need to give fluids. So I think that has changed. As, and I agree, there is not only the quantity, but also the type of fluid and the, how we move from a resuscitation phase to a maintenance phase and definitely recognize when a patient is already having signs of fluid overload to de-resuscitate. But I think it's all the, the process. Uh, it's not just we are liberal and then become conservative, not like that. It's just the process of uh, judiciously use of fluids throughout the whole resuscitation phase. Thank you. Our Do next you question. Is, okay, next question. <laughs> 
Uh, you get, you can finish your thought. No, no, I just was asking Brittany if she want to add something on that. No, I agree. Great answer. <laughs> Um, what strategies have you used and trained others on for appropriate daily volume assessment in the ICU? Weights can be difficult to obtain, hard to interpret, I's and O's in the EMER can be off if one number is mischarted, et cetera. Yeah. That's a I good point. Say, so, oh, go ahead, Brittany, you first. No, I was I was gonna keep my answer pretty simple, actually, because I, I think that you know there's been a lot of conversation on this. And I have, I think every method truly probably has its limitations. Um, just looking at eyes and nose, even when accurate, don't always tell the picture. Like there's always a conversation of what was the patient. I know at our facility, we are at least a third of our patients are outpatient transfers. And so, you know, the eyes and nose for our single record doesn't tell us everything about the patient admission. So um i my most important point on this is just making sure you're assessing the patient as a whole right so whether you're looking at daily weights right weight this person mentioned that weights can be difficult um someone's leaning on the bed the, the day that they do a daily weight or um you know there's there's some type of device on the bed or sometimes the weight the scale isn't working on the bed so i think no matter what you use just choosing to be consistent with that and also assessing the patient, right? So when we are diuresing a patient, we're looking at the eyes and nose because that's our goal for assessing drug effect and targeting drug effect, but we're not doing so without talking about the patient's physical exam findings and the chest x-ray for the day and you know other considerations specific to that patient. So kind of a simple answer is really finding a method, and kind of sticking with it, but making sure that you're considering the patient as a whole and not just kind of focusing on one specific value. Yeah, very important, right? And uh, the only thing I want to add to that is that uh, sometimes the focus is a lot on accuracy and should be more on precision, like the trend of the. So if you have the same uh, way to to capture weights, just the trend of the weights will be informative if you do it the same way. It doesn't matter if the scale is fully accurate or not. It matters like if you do it the same way every day you can have a precise metric and the trend will be informative. That being said, um, there are all these tools are imperfect, uh, but we have more tools now, right? Uh, now we cannot do bedside ultrasonography to every patient because we are very busy, but we can select those patients in which we are not sure what's going on to uh, have better assessments with bedside ultrasonography, for example. Uh, now we have a lot of monitors too to assess the trends of a stroke volume, cardiac output. When we are de-resuscitating a patient, particularly when we are doing CRRT, so that can also be informative. So um, we just need to start uh, integrating additional data that is available to us that we know how to interpret in our practice. It cannot be the same. It's not the same recipe for everybody because we have different type of tools in the ICU available. But start using more tools, but first recognizing which are those patients are challenging for fluid management. How you recognize? Just look simple thing. We are not achieving our goals of treatment. So if you recognize that, then those are your patients to highlight and start using these adjuvant tools, whatever is available and you feel comfortable using. And everybody needs to agree to standardize the practice, wherever you are. Excellent. Yeah, so I think we're at the hour, a little bit, a couple of minutes off, uh, but uh, I just wanna thank uh, the organizers uh, of this session for your uh, commitment to this topic and uh, all the uh, preparation to have a good uh, seminar uh, to all the attendees um for the participation your questions and of course to uh dr Bissell here which i have uh, had the pleasure to work with in the icu and uh, also do some research with her and also always good to share the screen even on distance discussing a topic like this you too and thank you everyone <laughs>
Thank you both for being with us today and thank you to our audience who was able to attend. Um, it will, this was recorded, so we'll be sharing it online for viewing as well for those that weren't able to make it today. But thank, thank you both to our speakers. We really appreciate it. And it was a lot of great insight into this topic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.